Welcome to DeFi by Design, where we talk all things blockchain and cryptocurrency while striving to educate, empower, and enrich. It's your boy Andy, and welcome back to the DeFi Slate YouTube channel. Smash the like button on this video that really helps us out, and sit back and enjoy the content. Thank you very much. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the DeFi by Design podcast. We're here today, episode 70. Uh, wow, it's been a it's been a send right here. 70 episodes of this podcast. It's enjoyable. Um, really, really excited to talk today with Andrea and Alan of Balancer DAO and Balancer Labs, an OG DeFi protocol. Um, I still I still remember the days when they first launched, and everyone was trying to figure out what the smart pools were all about and what their new Amen design was all about. And now we're here on all sorts of different chains, a bunch of upgrades. We're just excited to kind of see and talk about the evolution of Balancer and DeFi today and kind of where we think things are heading. So here today, of course, with Rob as well. Rob, how, how, how are we doing today, buddy? Yo, yo, doing well, man. Doing well. It's another beautiful day in Florida. It's great to be out here talking to Andrea and Alan. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm curious about kind of the, uh, the confluence between Balancer Labs and Balancer DAO um, and how they complement each other. Um, and then also, yeah, the evolution of how Balancer has you know, continued to stay ahead of the game uh, in, in, you know, all of these different AMMs and clones and, and kind of all these different forks of different projects um, and how Balancer, you know, keeps their moat um, and keeps their user base and, and uh, liquidity efficient. So I'll uh, pass it over to Alan and let him introduce himself and what he does over at Balancer. Hey guys, nice to meet you. Ple pleasure to be here. My name is Alan. I'm the DeFi partnership lead of Balancer Labs. I joined Balancer six, no, seven months ago. Um, yeah, and I'm pretty excited to be part of this team. We have a groundbreaking technology. I, I've i been in DeFi since since I was born. No, kidding. I, I, joined, I was working uh, as a nano on different DAOs and teams during the DeFi summer. And, and I was a liquidity provider of Balancer B2. And when I, when I saw the opportunity of joining the team uh, with the launch of Balancer B2, I didn't doubt that. And I, yeah, I jumped directly to, to Balancer technology because it's, for, for my personal point of view, it's one of the most groundbreaking technologies on, on DeFi. Sweet. And Andrea, how did you get into the DAO? <laughs> well, you know, I, you know, my, my, you know, story is a little bit less exciting. You know, I started, you know, in crypto maybe in 2017, but I was mostly, you know, looking at, uh, you know, privacy coins. And of course I was a Bitcoiner, et cetera, until, uh, you know, DeFi summer. DeFi summer is where everything changed. Um, I was, you know, very much interested on what was going on around, uh, you know, the ecosystem and I started as a, you know, as an LP, right. And then little by little, um, you know, I started to, you know, interact more with the community back in the days, uh, up to the point where they asked me to be more involved. Um, so, um, since, uh, like uh, July last year in 2021, I became a baller, which ballers are basically uh, like those, um, you know, community members that are, let's say, they are more engaged, you know, with the protocol and with the community. So that's how I started. And then after that, um, we created the DAO, the structure uh, that uh, we, are, we are using today. And, uh, and now, yeah, now I'm taking care of everything that has to do with partnerships and uh, you know, the liquidity mining program and, uh, you know, I, I take care of marketing a little bit and, uh, you know, uh, leading the stuff like game. Mm -hmm. Say again? Leading one of the, the, the VBAL games also. Oh, the VBALs. Yeah. Now we have all the, you know, the VBAL, uh, you know, uh, you know, hype, you know, for a new tokenomics around balancer. So yeah, I'm pretty much taking care a little bit of, of a few things, you know, the, 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 the problem with I mean, I wouldn't say a problem, but you know, the characteristic of the DAO is that you don't really have a, like a very specific, uh, position, you know, you can transition in between different places and stuff. And so, so yeah, that's, that's me pretty much. Yeah. So cool. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. I'm curious 
what you guys think specifically probably Alan kind of from the back from the early days of farming during kind of DeFi summer how the progression of yield farming has kind of gone in your eyes from let's say as simple as LPing with a reward on sushi or balancer or, or uniswap all the way to the complexities of like convex and ve tokenomics yeah. now and lockups kind of what's your thoughts overall i suppose just on the broad market of yield farming and kind of how it shifted um and then potentially even w w where you might see it going yeah that's a tough question um I, I we've been debating with andrea because we both are professional liquidity providers um and we've been witnessing the whole evolution from let's say DeFi 1.0 that balancer was part of that journey with uniswap and then this meme around DeFi 2.0 that tokenmark and olympus dao were leading uh, so i don't have like a hard answer for that because it is evolving i don't i'm still trying to see what the outcome will be in terms of how can we like we want to rent liquidity we want to own liquidity because everyone no, now wants to own the liquidity but at the same time it's really tough because you need to give in incentives or some kind of incentive in order to attract that liquidity but i think the model for example of tribe DAO with the protocol controller um I don't remember the PCB. I don't. Re I don't remember the acronym of that uh, word. Uh, is one of the coolest thing that I've been seeing in DeFi. Um, with Balancer, we've been debating what we should be doing in terms of uh, our tokenomics, and that's why Fernando suggests emulating what Curb did with their B model, both both escrow model and. It's pretty new for us because we are just we just launched a couple of days ago. The BBAL is only on mainnet. Uh, Gotches on L2s will be live probably in two weeks on Arbitrum and Polygon. But 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 by the type of conversation that we are having with Andrea and other DAOs and protocols, we are seeing a lot of interest on participating on this from DAOs that were not interested on, on Balancer due to the difficulties to attract the incentives to their pools. Now they are seeing an opportunity or to bribe that is an, a new mechanism in this DeFi 2.0 uh, world. Uh, and we are having many partners that are building bribe tooling on top of Balancer to unleash the VBAL wars or the VBAL battles. That's why how we are called it. Um, and yeah, I'm just experimenting uh, at, the, at the same time we are releasing this type of new functionalities on Balancer. Um, but yeah, with, with Andrea, we, we've been de debating a lot about DeFi 1.0, DeFi 2.0, and what will be the, the next step in terms of DeFi, because DeFi is still in a... How can I say, in a bearish mode? Most of the tokens of DeFi are like suffering a lot. And um, if you have like a, a, a token that it's really underrated, you are giving a lot of incentives to have like a, a, an attractive APY. But the, at the end of the day, you are like wasting millions of dollars per week just to attract liquidity. And um, it's not sustainable. It's it's okay for a bootstrapping phase, but I don't think anyone has the answer of what will happen in the next three years, two years. Um, I think Olympus DAO was pictured as the, the philosophical stone with their bonds, but eventually the price start to, to kill that model and Hopefully they they should not enter on a debt spiral mode, but there is no clear answer. We just look what happened to USDN yesterday yeah. or the day after before, and yeah, it's sad. It's sad to Any, watch. I mean, anytime there's a founder who's on Twitter challenging SBF to make his token pump, is it's probably not the not yeah. the best sign and. 
I mean, I think we saw a lot of the bootstrapping of liquidity in DeFi happen early in 20 in 2020, where we really just tried to basically blow the blow the lid off almost and and kind of we entered the hangover phase, which is okay because we got the interest that was kind of it was needed, right? We needed to basically just provide a, a, just a big bang to really get it off the ground because effectively there was nothing there before, but now we're kind of in the hangover. But what, what if that allows us to do is find these better strategies to actually create real value and create, you know, re real systems, um, you know, that can uh, continue to grow and flourish as you've saying. So it's kind of like a never ending um, kind of uh, journey to find the best tokenomics and the best yield farming opportunities and kind of how to properly incentivize. Um, and it's a and, big challenge. Yeah. And it's, a, it's, it's, it's really good because it challenged ourselves, our DAOs and our protocol to push more and more to improve the tokenomics, to improve the way we give incentives. And I think the DAO and Andrea should know it better are like the DAO of Balancer is pretty new, but if you see the conversation that are happening internally, they want to create a better system, a better model to give more uh, sustainability to the DAO. And at the end of the day, from my personal point of view, I see the DAO as the main umbrella of all the different entities that will, will, will fly around Balancer Protocol. I don't know, Andrea, what do you think? <laughs> Yeah, well, the the conversation uh, has been, uh, you know, uh, you've been, you guys have been talking quite a, for about a few few points. You know, uh, the original question was how basically how uh, DeFi evolved from a very simple, you know, uh, provide liquidity and get uh, stupid APYs, right? Um, well, you, you know, uh, the, the problem with that is that of course that was the the spike that uh, ignited the DeFi summer and then, and that allowed, you know, the entire industry to evolve to, to where we are today. Um, now, yeah, as, as Alan is saying, you know, the problem is now, how do you retain liquidity and attract more liquidity and uh, continue to innovate without uh, having to spend, you know, crazy amount of, you know, uh, you know, you know, funds or, you know, money, whatever you want to call it to, to maintain this liquidity. So that's very difficult. Um, of course, you know, one thing that we know, the thing is that we, we keep, we keep experimenting, uh, on, uh, you know, DeFi 1.0, now we have DeFi 2.0 and everything, but the only thing we really know for sure is that liquidity mining is a very powerful tool and is the only one so far that has proven to be successful to attract, you know, uh, $200 billion in TVL uh, across, you know, across the DeFi ecosystem. Uh, without those, those incentives, we wouldn't be at this point, you know. So, um, you know, of course now uh, the, the, the market is becoming more, more competitive. It's not what it used to be. So I can hear my... So basically we used to only have like Uniswap and uh, Sushi, uh, you, you guys remember that. And then of course Balancer. Um, now you have, you know, multiple, uh, DEXs across multiple chains and you have forks and you have this and that, and they're all competing for the same liquidity. So it's, it become, you know, the market is becoming much more efficient. Uh, and of course it's maturing as well. Uh, so I don't think we will gonna, we're going to go back to those uh, good old days when you used to have like, a. I don't know, 500% APY for like three months, consecutive months or whatever. And so things are going to evolve and they're going to, they're going to probably slow down. They're going to be, they're going to look much less attractive. So we need to find a new way. I mean, to... those were the good old days, man. Yeah. Those, those are yeah, the good old days. <laughs> they were, they were, and everything was so crazy. And, uh, you know, I remember the first time I, you know, I, uh, put some, some money to work into compound and i was like calling my wife hey look at this you know look you could see you know the the, the interest you know um just you know, keep adding, adding up every real second time. yeah real time so, <laughs> of course you know all that all that magic is gone now you know we, we're much more mature now we're different and you know so yeah things have, have changed man for sure so yeah so do you guys think that the yields yeah. are, are going to get smaller as like more people come in? Is that, is that like a general, is that the general take that the kind of the adoption curve is, is beneficial for everybody involved, but the overall yield curve is going to come down or like, what's your, what's your take on, on that? 
Alan, I have right. like my wish is that the swap fees should be enough attractive enough to tackle the incentives that we give to to a liquidity but that's not what's happening like if you see the the analytics you will see that 80% 90% of the trading volume comes from money makers and bots so we are still in an early stage of retail user doing swap on on dexes but eventually when this blows off and everyone is happy doing trading on DEXs versus uh, centralized exchange, uh, we will see like a more suitable APY in terms of swap fees. But at the same time, we are also on Balancer experimenting, increasing the, the swap fees for some specific pools during these volatility days. And we are seeing the increase of the swap, the, the APR of the swap fees by a lot. Like our own pool, the 8020 pool of Val ETH is getting like 5% of APR today due to the swap fees because we increased the, the fee for that particular pool. So I think this is one of the things that Balancer has and liquidity creators and liquidity creators should be taking the lead of experimenting with the type of customization that balancer provides to play with changing the swap fees during volatility markets earn more fees so i think that's one of the the biggest advantage of balancer versus other decentralized exchanges Yeah, and and do you anticipate kind of the fees going up? Like you mentioned, um, you know, DeFi 1.0, like that really had a big, big uh, bang. And then those tokens have kind of tapered off as far as their prices. Like, you know, even even if the, the rates go down because of like the, the new money coming in and the swap fees aren't uh, sufficient to to hold those rates where where they are kind of double digits and and beyond. Is there a is there another path for kind of DeFi tokens governance tokens to increase in price, or do you think it's almost entirely based on TVL? I don't think it's based on TVL. I, I see TVL just a vanity metric. I care more about trading volume um, because it's where the the fees should come from for the DAOs or for the treasuries. Um, I'm, I'm envisioning like a, a DeFi protocols that start building on top of Balancer and start doing some money Legos strategies. But right now there are really few of them because one of the things, this is my personal opinion, but one of the things that I'm seeing is that builders sometimes are way ahead or really outside of what the market is demanding on or saying. So builders has this ten of build whatever they want to do because they think that what they are doing, the market it's needing, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes the market is needed some type of tooling or, or a feature that is not aligned what with the with the intention of the builders so we we are still in this stage that builders know that they can raise millions in dollar by doing some some dabs but eventually this DeFi DeFi will evolve and the market will merge with the builders and we will start doing some financial uh, implementations for DeFi, but we are not on, on that stage yet. Got it. Got it. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like that product market fit, bringing in what the what the market wants versus what the builders are actually building and kind of collabing yeah. in the middle. Um, you know, and I think I think a lot of the market wanted uh, projects like Balancer to basically to basically implement some sort of change of tokenomics, which you guys have obviously reacted to with the VE model. I'm kind of curious. So is, is the VE model a bet on the balancer team and protocol long-term? Like would it, would it, uh, obviously 
there's no advice in this podcast um, and anything that we do, but in the sense of locking up the, the tokens for four years, is that, is, would you say that that's the best way to take a bet on the balance routine and protocol? Or if not, kind of like what, what would be a general strategy, um, you know, for somebody to who's very bullish on balance or long term to kind of uh, take action on? Well, uh, a few things here. Okay, number one, the VE BAL is a copy of the curve uh, tokenomics. However, our max, to max uh, lock, lock in time is only one year, not, not four. So this is because we wanted to, you know, give a little bit more freedom to, to the user, to the average user. I, I personally believe that four years is way too long. Okay, so that's the first point. So there is, there is much less risk when you're locking your token for like 25% of whatever, you know, Curve is doing. That's number one. Then when it comes to, you know, uh, how to play this, you know, the, uh, the balancer. Uh, okay, I think uh, Alan is gone. <laughs> it disappeared. Okay, so how to play this, th this game? Um, well, it, it's going to be something very similar to what, um, you know, the infrastructure that we're building uh, on top of the VBAL is very similar to, um, to whatever, you know, Curve has. So you're going to have uh, like a bribing platform uh, that we're building. Uh, you know, well, we are not building. A, 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 another team is building, which is going to be, um, you know, there are a number of, of platforms. But, you know, if I can give you a name, you know, Redactor Cartel is doing a great job at attracting all those bribers. And um, so this is something that is going to be very powerful for sure. So if I was, if I was an average user at, at this time, what I would probably do is wait for uh, those platforms, that, uh, those, those bribing platforms to come out and, uh, and, and, uh, and see what the market offers. You know? So there is no rush at the moment to, to lock and uh, commit to one year, you know, uh, you know, one year locking uh when when you know the entire you know the entire structure is going to come out in the next 48 hours or you know uh, you know next uh, this week you're going to have a lot of news regarding all this so that's probably the my, my best uh, advice i can give even though i cannot give financial advices of course so yeah and the the tokenomics here at play like when the ve model uh someone locks up their tokens for, you know, some extended period of time to, to get voting power. The idea here is that someone would want exposure to the balancer token, but not necessarily uh, want the voting power. And then they can delegate that voting power to someone else. And then, you know, it's it, the financial tooling that is built on bribes is starting to, is starting to reflect more of like uh, this, this economy of governance uh, more so than the kind of like economy of liquidity. Um, so how do you see kind of the, the evolution of uh, the curve model playing out? Like, do you anticipate, you know, the, inf the incentives uh, still kind of just directing liquidity or is, is this model something that can be applied further? You know, like what, what is uh, kind of the next step here um, once bribe tooling is built out and and balancer kind of has this more comprehensive ecosystem, what what does that enable? Um, is it like you know someone can borrow against their VE tokens, um, lend them out for for interest? You know what what are some of the uh, new strategies that are unveiled after uh, this tooling is built out on balancer? Yeah, well, it's a it's a very good question. I cannot give you an answer, or a straight answer of what is going to be the evolution because we are literally navigating in uncharted waters. So uh, f for sure, what, what is going to happen now is this bribing, you know, v, you know we call it bar wars, uh, bar battles, some, some call it. Uh, and this is going to probably enable, you know, you know, a flywheel effect and you're going to see a lot of liquidity coming in. Now the next stage is going to be how are you going to, uh, you know, act on governance, you know, because in the end, BAL token is a, is a governance token, you know. So uh, the next step is going to be uh, building an infrastructure for, for actual governance. You know, at the moment, you know, the DAO itself, it works, you know, it operates under, you know, govern governance voting power. Um, so now everyone is pretty much focused on the economic incentives. 
incentive of locking those tokens, but no one is really looking at what the evolution is going to be when it comes to how the, you know, the, the platform or the protocol or the DAO is going to operate in the future and how we can, you know, use those votes to, you know, to, you know, to evolve, you know, the way we actually operate, you know, internally as a, as a DAO, you know, as a, as an organization, you know, decentralized organization. So this is probably what uh, I can tell you today. You know, honestly, it's very difficult to, to predict the future, you know, um, but uh, yeah, there, there's this area of governance that I think is gonna be the next big thing that now, for now, is a little bit, uh, uh, you know, um, not on the spotlight. To be determined. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, 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 for yeah. sure. Yeah, and, and that kind of brings us to the convo of, having the balancer labs team and kind of the balancer DAO and potentially even like a grant DAO or a, you know, a legal kind of sub DAO or a, a marketing sub DAO. I'm curious what, why did balancer decide to structure how it's structured? Was it in the name of decentralization? Was it in the name of regulation? Kind of walk us through the, the structure of the DAO and the labs and kind of how those two entities kind of commingle and a bit of the reasoning as to why it's, it's set up, uh, as, as such. Okay. So the DAOs in general, you know, when you, when you walk around in the, you know, DeFi or, or the crypto industry, you always hear DAO, you know, this word DAO, but that nobody really knows, you know, why we're doing it. And, you know, if you, if you read the, the, I mean, there's not much to, to, to read, but honestly, uh, the first exper experiments of DAOs were like back in the 17, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and since then, we're still experimenting when it comes to governance, you know, it's very difficult. So um, why, how, first of all, how did we get here? So basically, um, the Balancer, the protocol, has been built by Balancer Labs. And Balancer Labs is like a corporation. They, they have their own CEO, they have the CTO, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, but, you know, certain decisions and... You know, um, certain decisions can't really be made by a corporation that has maybe, um, you know, they are probably based in the U.S. or, you know, there are a number of regulatory co constraints and concerns uh, that do not allow corporations or, you know, uh, labs, in, in this case, Balancer Labs, to, uh, to take care of everything that runs around the protocol, okay? So they really need, a, like, a decentralized structure, uh, something that, could take advantage of the current state of affairs, which is basically uh, a very, you know, um, uncertain, you know, regulatory framework or environment. So uh, we wanted to take advantage of that. And uh, they believe that uh, building a DAO uh, to operate on top of Balancer will resolve many issues. Now, the second point is, the second, the second question was, how do, we, how do we structure this? It's not easy, especially when, you know, the DAO, uh, the DAO generally, uh, it's, um, you know, uh, uses a flattening of hierarchical uh, structures. So you don't really have like a, like a boss and uh, other people. So it's very difficult to really self-organize. Okay. So Balancer Labs in general, it helped uh, a little bit direct this, uh, this organization. And we decided to create a number of soup DAOs. Okay. And uh, this comes from, uh, you know, basically studying, you know, other, sub, uh, other DAOs. Like, for example, we had a look at IndexCorp. We had a look at uh, UMA. Uh, we, we basically study a little bit of market. Uh, Why Earn, which is a big, um, you know, big example for, for everyone in the industry. So that's how we started. We started by looking at others and trying to take, to take the best parts of, you know, of all, all, these, all these organizations. And um, so that's how we started. We created like little soup DAOs and each soup DAO basically follows, uh, you know, um, has, you know, has a number of members inside this, this soup DAO. And, uh, you know, we carry on a number of, you know, tasks that usually they are, um, they are very much, uh, you know, um, uh, coordinated or at least they are um, in the same line as, you know, the same principle as Balancer Labs. So it's very, very, we, at the moment we're working really, really closely. But at some point, you know, Balancer Labs is supposed to disappear forever and the DAO will be actually be the structure that the organization that controls it all. But we are still in this tran transitioning phase. The DAO just started only four months ago. We're very new and uh, we're still trying to figure it out what's the best way of governance, what's the best way of self-organization, et cetera. You know, 
does he answer your question? Yeah, man, it does. And it's, it's, it alludes to how um, sub DAOs are able to kind of make the flattened hierarchy a little bit more productive in terms of creating these like smaller guilds where there's probably some sort of leadership within these sub DAOs. But at the end of the day, it's all kind of still in that flattened structure. So it gives you a bit more well, structure and it gives you, um, you know, a, a probably a more efficient way to kind of work. And I also understand why it's important to kind of take that shift from an, uh, a U.S. base, especially or just any entity in any nation state and basically move to a non-governable entity. Um, you know, I think that's I think that's extremely powerful. Uh, it, it kind of goes along with, with, with the ethos of like the blockchain being immutable. It's kind of like, well, if the blockchain is immutable, then the people that are working also have to be a part of these basically organizations that are kind of like you can't you can't really, you know, you can't take them down you know, type of thing. So it's important to push that towards you know, that realm. But as you said, it takes time because once you get there, you can't really go back. Um, so, you know, it takes that it takes steps to make sure that you get there properly and make the right you know, kind of choices uh, on governance and on these things that that you mentioned. Yeah, you want to basically, you want to try to uh, reduce the risk of any attack, attacking vector. So, um, so yeah, what you say is very true. I actually agree 100%. Uh, we need to be, you know, uh, robust and anti-fragile. And probably the best way to achieve the, this anti-fragility is by spreading, you know, the governance across the world, you know, like uh, anyone can participate and anyone is, can be, can be, uh, removed and uh, so and and the system keeps moving forward, you know. So that's that's what we that's what we're trying to achieve at Balancer now. Yeah, and the model is consistent with you know other applications and then other other organizations that have started out as a centralized company to bootstrap uh, a DAO and progress towards decentralization over time. You know, it's not it's not like someone can just flip a switch and then all of a sudden all of this, you know, becomes decentralized. It's as you described, the distribution of voting power and governance power across the entire population of those who, who are interested in, in Balancer. And as Balancer grows and matures, the population grows as well. And then obviously governance power is distributed even more evenly um, across this entire population. Sure. I agree. Yeah. And, you know, at, like this, this progression, right? You know, like as we get into more and more decentralization, I think this holds true for like most other applications as well as some of the incentive models. Like, you know, initially it was uh, these kind of uh, liquidity mining proposals that were distributing the tokens, but it was, I don't know, it was like maybe you know yourself or Alan that were that were deciding, okay, you know, we're going to distribute a million tokens over the course of a month. Um, but now, you know, we're incorporating more and more of the community into those decisions. And it's no longer uh, you and, and, you know, other decision makers on behalf of the DAO. Um, as the DAO becomes more decentralized, we're kind of incorporating the user feedback uh, and, and giving that and to the builders so that the builders can incorporate it much more closely. And the users and the builders become more composable. Um, yeah. And I kind of see this as a, as a route, like when the tooling becomes available for users to actually implement their own strategies. Um, I, I want to give a shout out to DeFi Saber because they've started to implement something like this, where you have, uh, they call it a recipe creator, and you can kind of stack your strategies um, and implement, you know, kind of cross application strategies with no code. Um, so delivering those tools to end users uh, would allow users to uh, direct and kind of build the applications themselves and and users become builders, you know, rather than having these two separate groups. I think it probably starts with uh, incentives where users can start to direct their own incentives uh, via the, the VE model. Um, and then after that, they can, with the right tooling, start to build their own strategies and build their own applications that put the money Legos together uh, rather than building them from scratch. Sure, one hundred percent. I agree. Um, yeah, I didn't know about this uh, this specific application, uh, Rob. I, I had no idea they they came out. You know, we can talk about it later. Maybe I can study it a little bit more. I was I, I'm not prepared. Yeah. <laughs> so. No, uh, no, it's good. I, I mean, the 
the idea is like someone can provide liquidity to balancer and then in the same transaction they can lock it into a ve balancer and then you know if there's some way to lend against or borrow against the ve then you know all of this you can stack into one transaction um and and typically like you would need a shadowy super coder you know to to code some flash loan in order to execute that strategy but i think it's the it's the no code tools that are starting to bring those use cases to the end user and and narrow the gap between users and builders, um, which ultimately puts us into a more decentralized uh, population as the users, you know, take on more self-custody and, and more building for themselves. Because ultimately that's kind of, and I'm curious if, if you see a similar vision um, as decentralization plays out and the market becomes more mature, uh, eventually we get to a point where uh, users self-custody their own funds, you know, you, Andy, myself, we're all self-custodying our funds now and, and interacting with these applications. Do you see um, a reality where m the majority of the population is is in self-custody? Okay, or are we so, kind of destined to you know use these custody providers like banks and whatnot? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the self-custody is the is an essential part of crypto in general. That's what we always advocate for and. I think we should all go there. Now, the um, barriers of entry for DeFi in general, uh, they're still very high. I mean, um, and they're getting higher, you know, because, because the, the, the space is becoming more and more, you know, sophisticated and complex and uh, it's not as easy as it used to be. It used to be easier during summer, summer 2020, but not anymore. So um, possibly at some point, uh, the, the, you know, the you know, the, the level of expertise will probably be reduced when the, the industry mature and you will find application that will help, you know, the average investor, the average, the average user to, to, you know, to uh, interact with these apps. But for now, um, for sure, I will see in the future something like this. But now what I see right now is more complexity and, uh, and, and more sophistication in general. So you really need to be on top of it you know, 24 seven, sometimes, uh, I, I can't get, um, you know, up to speed with everything that is happening around us. You know, I, you, you miss a week and it's like, if you missed two months, uh, because the, the, the industry and the, the, you know, the, um, the, you know, the ecosystem is, the, you know, is evolving so quickly that it's so difficult even for us that we work full time. Okay. So, um, eventually at some point things will be, will be smoother, uh, but f not, not now, not definitely not, not something is going to happen anytime soon. You know, doesn't make sense. I don't yeah, no, it's, it's, I don't it's a negative. process. No, but it's a process. Exactly. I mean, it's simply just easier to have somebody else custody funds, but that, yeah, it doesn't align with the, uh, with the kind of DAOs and decentralization thesis. And I mean, talking about custody funds, when it comes to to balance or DAO, are you guys using a multi-sig of some sort to hold the treasury? Like how does the BAL token treasury align with the DAO versus the, the labs? And how does that, how is that governed currently? Yeah, uh, we have a 5% of total, uh, total token allocation, which has been, which is for the DAO. Okay. Which is basically our treasury. Uh, and this, of course, you know, this treasury is controlled by a multi-sig and the, uh, you know, and this multi sig the signers are, you know, the, you know, one of the, you know, some of the most recognized names in the industry. So um, this is how we operate at the moment. Um, so, yeah, this is, uh, is what, what we do at the moment. We're using like st st standard so, stuff. Yeah. yeah. So if, if people want to build on Balancer or contribute, um, that you know and, and they need some sort of grant or uh, uh you know some sort of token allocation to to do this whether it be to provide liquidity or to pay for the operation um you know their best bet is to come to the dow effectively yeah okay we have a special uh, let's say a special group which is uh, balancer grants it's called balancer grant which is actually a soup dow now which is run by the community again and that has, you know, it runs on a, on a quarterly basis. So they have like a million dollars to allocate, well, as a budget, let's say, and they receive applications and these applications on there are then uh, analyzed by, by the team. And uh, uh, we tend to, to be fairly successful. We had a, quite a few interesting, you know, grantees so far. 
And so everyone that is interested on building something using the Balancer technology, which is extremely flexible, uh, I will strongly encourage to, to go to Balancer Grants. Uh, I think you're pretty easily, you can easily find it uh, on Twitter for sure, on Balance, Balancer Grants, and uh, send out an application. There's all the instructions are there. Uh, it's pretty straightforward stuff. So um, we just closed wave three, uh, just closed like a week ago, and now we're just beginning with the wave four. So whoever is interested can definitely you know, send us uh, an application form and we'll take care of it. I'm actually part of the grants, you know, the grants committee as well. So, um, yeah, there's cool. a lot of, lot of stuff going on there too. Uh, man, we don't, it's nonstop, you know, nonstop. Yeah. So, so that kind of contributes to the growth of the Balancer ecosystem, right? Like grants and providing funding for people that want to build tooling or do community growth, stuff like that. What other sub DAOs are you excited about um, that contribute to the growth of Balancer? Uh, like, you know, aside from the grants, you know, yeah. Yeah, well, we have, at the moment, we have uh, five soup DAOs, you know. Of course, all of them, they're very important within the ecosystem because they take care of very specific areas, you know. So you have the dev one, and then you have, uh, uh, you know, of course, partnership, you have marketing, you have treasury, you have ops. Let's say ops is more like, a, like a, has been delegated powers uh, from the different soup DAOs. Uh, so they take care of, for example, uh, the, the, the salaries and they take care of, you know, uh, holding the funds, you know, like, uh, all, you know, we don't, we don't self custody funds, like, uh, let's say partnership or marketing or whatever. They, we don't have our own funds. We delegate, you know, ops to take care of it. So basically they all play a very important role. So I wouldn't be able to tell you which one is the best one. Definitely, you know, all of them, they have their strengths. And they are, they are in, you know, integral and uh, fundamental parts for the, 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 the success of the DAO. So all of them, really. Um, for, what I, for what it's worth, uh, you know, the partnerships with DAO, we, we've been working very hard during the past uh, quarter and we achieved so many things. And uh, we have so many other projects uh, that we want, to, we want to start. And we work very closely with Balancer Labs, you know, the partnership uh, of Balancer Labs, which of course is Alan and other members. And um, so, yeah, man, it's, it's like a nonstop, it's a 24 seven job pretty much, you know? Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm very, very excited about how these things are going, you know, compared to where we started, man. If I think about six months ago, man, we're, we were nothing. We're like five people, you know, like <laughs> talking on Discord with nothing, nothing really specific to do, nothing really, you know, very, you know, nothing uh, consistent. But now, now it's, everything changed. Everything is changed and uh, it's becoming more and more complex and sophisticated, you know, same as the e ecosystem. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's where the, the growth is happening is kind of at the top of the stack where like we're building more and more complexities, um, which is, is great for those who are in DeFi. Um, and, and it's, probably pushing farther and farther out like you're saying you know we're we're all involved in DeFi, but it's still difficult to keep up uh with all of the all of the innovation that's happening so someone who's just now entering the ecosystem you know that that's probably too far gone like the curve convex yeah. bribery model you know someone who's entering in 2022 they're they're probably never going to get to that level of uh involvement in DAOs or or liquidity providing um do you, you know, at a point, like, I'm just, I'm curious, is there like any, any cap to this complexity? Probably not, right? No, it's going to get more and more complex. But one thing I, 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 I want to say is that, you know, everyone, everyone can participate. I mean, you, you would be surprised on how many new members are coming to us and uh, they want to participate in a way or another. And we're very open to them, you know. So even though, you know, it's getting more and more complex, there is still, you know, there is still some, you know, some meat in there. there we, we, there's, there's still a possibility to participate. So and for everyone that is interested on in joining DAOs, the best strategy, the best thing I would say is probably finding like those, you know, those projects that maybe are very solid, uh, but that are less popular, you know? Of course, if you go to Y Earn, uh, you're never going to get there, you know, let's be honest. But maybe you can find some other projects that are still very interesting to you. It can be anything, really. 
you know, there are a number of them, you know, <laughs> like thousands of them that maybe they're just starting or they, they need, you know, contributors and they need like, uh, you know, community managers or whatever. And, uh, you know, th these people, they need, they need actually, uh, you know, human capital, you know, so there's still a possibility there. Of course, the more we, we progress, the more we go ahead, you know, you know, communities like Balancer or, you know, as I said, Wireen, et cetera, it will, become, it will become more and more complicated to probably make, make an impact within the community because the community, the more bigger, the bigger it becomes, the difficult it is to, to, you know, to make an impact. But still, you know, you can still join like a early stage projects and, and be, be part of those projects. You know, same way as I did, you know, I didn't know that Balancer was going to become what it became. You know, I just been around from the very beginning and you know here i am so I, i'm sure other people can do the same you know yeah definitely and there's there's new projects spinning off of older ones all the time yeah, all so if someone isn't you know at the level where they understand convex curve leveraged lp ve model like that's okay because someone can contribute to uh, a more basic model that maybe has been around much longer something like Uma or Balancer, you know, even though these projects have, have been building since 2017, there's still new money Legos to build on top. You know, someone who's just now in, entering can, can still apply for a grant and then build on the more fundamental technology, some, something like Balancer. Yeah, and then another thing I'm noticing within the, this the ecosystem is that because we have so many competing chains, on all, all, on all of those competing chains, you have like, uh, let's say, or a friendly fork or a fork of a certain project or whatever. So, um, and, and th this is actually programs that we actually follow too, which is this friendly fork uh, program, which basically we, uh, we partner with, uh, you know, great teams that they produce like a fork of balancer, like for example, B Beethoven on Phantom. You might, I don't know if you know them or not, but basically, um, you know, th these are great teams. They have great teams. They have great fundamentals. They're amazing. Uh, they, you know, they're friends with us. And, you know, you can join. I mean, they started just a few months ago, like maybe less than a year ago. Now I don't remember exact date, but not too long ago. And you can join those communities and be like someone that really makes a difference there. So, uh, and more chains are coming. You know, the comp competition is going gonna, is gonna to be more and more. And um, so and more and more projects will come and build on those new chains. So that definitely there is something there, you know. What are, what are the trade-offs with that friendly fork program? <laughs> you know, does it, does, it take, does it take away any like value? You know, if Balancer was to go deploy on Phantom, you know, why, why did you choose to let someone else fork your code rather than deploy there yourself? It's a good question, man. This is just a strategic decision from Balancer Labs. They don't have the, uh, they don't have the capacity, the technical, you know, the bandwidth to, to deploy on other chains. You know, all those chains, you know, like, for example, we are on Polygon and Arbitrum. They went through, uh, you know, a certain, uh, you know, risk uh, analysis and they decided that, uh, you know, risk benefit analysis. And they said, okay, this is worth going there. And, you know, there is no worth, you know. So to compensate for this, given the fact that the balancer technology is in our opinion, in my opinion, is superior in terms of AMM and, uh, you know, underlying technologies is so good. We want to have this technology everywhere. So how do we reach, for example, Avalanche? Okay. Or how do we reach Phantom? How do we reach, uh, I don't know. Now there are more comings. Okay. Um, um, so how do we do that? Well, the only thing we can do is finding good teams that teams that we can trust and, uh, and, uh, you know, let them, you know, deploy contracts, launch the platform and do what they have to do. And, uh, and we just, you know, in, in exchange, basically we have a token, you know, they, they allocate a number of tokens to us, uh, to the treasury from the balancer treasury. Uh, so we have exposure to their, to their, you know, to their project. Okay. But we're not involved. So basically it's a way for us to have a stake, stakeholding position in, you know, on, for example, now we're launching a new fork on Avalanche, which is called Hexagon. Okay. We have a stake on that particular project. Okay. So, um, instead of being there and doing, you know, doing all the work, we let a new project go there so they can 
actually uh, get their own identity because each chain is different. Okay, so in in terms of uh, Avalanche, um, they, they have their own users, they have their own community, and you want to have like a native, you know, Dex, you know, using maybe the balancer technology on the on the on the particular chain. So th this is the vision that we have at the DAO. We want to empower other teams to do the same and be successful if they're good teams, right? So this is this is pretty much the trade. The trade-off, of course, you know, there's always known unknowns. So you don't really know, uh, you know, uh, how far the project is going to go and you don't really control the team. So you really, you know, it's difficult to, to see too far into the future, okay? But, you know, in the end, it's kind of a bet. You know, we're betting on, on this particular, on, on a certain project, on a certain team, and we hope things go well. We do our due diligence, et cetera, but we cannot completely eliminate all the risks. But risks, they're always, they're always going to be there. If Balancer is going gonna, is gonna to deploy on Avalanche, we will have certain risk. And, um, and if another team does, you know, of course, there are other, other risks. Uh, does it make sense? Sorry, man, I talk a lot. You know, I yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> no, it's good. Yeah, you're, you're taking a bet on Balancer's underlying technology. Um, Correct, yeah. And you're kind of funding, you know, the builders that are going and deploying that, that technology on other chains, you know, so that you have a, you have a, a stake, like you're saying, um, and you're betting on, yeah, balancer uh, through kind of a proxy. Um, and it doesn't require the, the resources that, that it would if, if you were to deploy there yourself. Correct, correct, correct. Yeah. Yeah, man. Well, we're we're getting close on time here. Uh, Andy, what what you got? Yeah, that's about it. it, it it's been a pleasure, Andre. Thanks for coming on and talking all things balancer. It's been enjoyable. Love to see the the, the OG DeFi uh, crews kind of grow and thrive. So uh, excited to see the future. And yeah, thanks for coming on, man. Thank you. Pleasure of mine, guys. Thank you very much for your time, and uh, I wish you the best. I hope to talk to you soon in another podcast.